recognize your participation. <laughs> and with our special award-winning performer tonight, uh, we'll be offering our program on Len's fractured history of uh, personal computers. And so take it away, Len. OK. Um, I've, I've titled this uh, Warped History of Personal Computers. And the history of personal computers in uh, 50 minutes is overly ambitious. But this will be warped, fractured, but from my perspective. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, a picture of my very first computer, uh, the Digicomp 1. This was not an electric, electronic computer. This was a mechanical computer. And uh, it cost something like sixteen ninety five or something. And what you get was uh, a bunch of these plastic parts and a bunch of cut off soda straws. And the way you program this thing is you take one of these little soda straws and you stick it on a little peg here. And there are rubber bands holding all these things together. And when you slide this slider back and forth, these little arms either bump a soda straw or they don't. And uh, you can actually do, as it says, see how a computer adds, uh, multiplies, plays challenging games. So you can actually uh, do digital computing <clears throat> on the Digicomp 1. Um, the benefit for me was this was actually where I got my first experience in, and practice in using binary arithmetic. What year was this? This was in the early 1960s. Um, now, I know that uh, Bill Johnson is thinking to himself, binary arithmetic, what is that? And so, uh, um, so we're going to do a little side trip to the, the little old red schoolhouse and take a look at the kind of arithmetic that you know, which is the uh, decimal system. It turns out that you're a lot more advanced than a digital computer because you actually can count to 10. And the digital computer can only count to one. Uh, and and uh, if you lay out these columns for each of the positions of digits in the decimal system, you know that there's a, a tens column, and you can go one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 down. And when you run out of numbers, what do you have to do? You put a zero there, and you put a one in the next column over, right? And then you go. 10, 11, 12, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. You get to 19, what happens? Well, you put a zero there, and you put the next number available in this column. And you go 20, 21, 30, 40, 50, 60, and finally you get to 99, and what happens? Well, you put a zero in the first column, a zero in the second column, and a one in the third column, et cetera. Uh, this is the way you've been counting, but what you might not have realized is each one of these columns where you put your decimal numbers is uh, representing a power of 10. 10 to the first power is 10. 10 to the second power is 10 times 10, or 100. 10 to the third power is 10 times 10 times 10s, or 1,000. And so if we had a number like, don't let me make this big. Uh, if we had a number like 131, how does that really work in the decimal system? Well, that's over here in the, one, in the 10 to the second power place. So that's 1 times 10 to the second power, or 1 times 10 to the 100, plus 3 times 10, plus 1 times 1, which comes out 131. Yeah, that makes sense. But you've been doing all this, all this uh, powers of 10 arithmetic all your life, or since grade school, without realizing it. But now, suppose you only had one number besides zero to mess with, which is what a digital computer has. And so now, when you start counting, you go one, ran out of numbers. What do you do? Put a zero, and you put a one in the next, next place over. So then you go one, zero, one, one, whoops, ran out of numbers again. Put a zero there, a zero there, and a one over there. And then you go one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 one zero, one, one, one and run out again. You put another digit. Well, instead of base 10, we're now we're using base 2. So in these columns, you have 2 to the first power, 2 squared, which is 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 2 times 2 are 8, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So now if you wanted to represent a number, uh, or if you had this number in, in binary, 10011, it would really be 1 times, whoops, that 
first digit was over here in the 16 column. So that's 1 times 16 plus 0 times 8 plus 0 times 4 plus 1 times 2 plus 1 times 1, which comes out in your language, 19. But in the computer's language, it's 10011. Why do computers count to only two? The reason is that it's very easy to deal with two digits. You can do it lots of ways. You could do it with an on-off switch. There's either a zero or one. The switch is either on or it's off. There's two choices. And you can have a bunch of switches on and off, and you could represent lots of numbers with these switches. You could punch a hole in a card or not. So you could have a whole bunch of holes in a card, the old IBM cards, where there's either a hole or not. It's digital, okay? It's binary. Uh, and it's in powers of two. So as you need larger and larger numbers, you add more columns to this, and it goes 1, 2, 4, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Those numbers probably sound familiar to you because a lot of things that you've seen in your computer, like you get some new memory or something, are usually in powers of two is one of those numbers. When we say 1K in computer language, we're not meaning 1,000. We're meaning 1,024 because of, of the system. Now, so one of my friends, who I won't bother naming <laughs> to keep him innocent, said, well, I heard that there's such a thing as hexadecimal. What's that all about? Well, it's not worth talking a lot about, but in hexadecimal, you have 16 numbers available. So how can we represent those? Well, what these guys did was they said, okay, here's how we do it in hexadecimal. And this column over to the far side. We go 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Ooh, we need some more digits. So let's go A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, which gives you 16 numbers to play with. And so if you're using some computers that are working with hexadecimal digits, you might see some really strange things like, like uh, 0A or something, or 1A, and, and uh, they'll be counting in hexadecimal. But that's getting boring. But that is a little bit why, uh, oops. Let's do the wrong button here. I want to go back to, um, where was I? Oh, yes. Back, back to where we came in. That's why in digital computers, they use base 2, because you can represent all of the numbers with just two digits. And then by adding more lines. The Digicomp, by the way, was a three-bit computer. There were three places where you could put zeros and ones, which means you could count eight different numbers, or 111 would be seven, and then you have zeros, which would be another number. Any case, uh, back in the same time frame when I was playing with the Digicomp 1, I got a hold of this crazy thing, which was called a Geniac. This was an electromechanical computer, and it came as a more or less a kit with this pegboard with all these holes and these discs with all these holes and a bunch of parts and screws and things, and what you did was you put in a little lamp socket and a battery, and then underneath the board, you ran wires to various positions under here. Uh, you ran wires under screws. And then in these wheels that are turnable, you could put little screws. So as you turn these things in various combinations, you have them either on or off, and it's a next step up from Digicomp 2 and how many numbers you can deal with. Enough of Geniac. Back in the early 1970s, Hewlett Packard came out with this machine. Uh, it has a keyboard, has an extra numeric keyboard. It has a, play, a readout here, and it came with the basic programming language. And you could write programs, and in this little window here is a cassette tape recorder. So you could actually write programs in the basic computer language, and you could store them on a cassette tape. And Wait a minute, this was the early 1970s. In those days, pre-personal computer days, if you were working in a company and you put in a purchase requisition for a computer, that was a big deal thing. Because in those days, computers were like millions of dollars installations, and most companies had a corporate policy that you had to go to the chief financial officer of the company to get approval to buy any computer. For all practical purposes, this thing was a computer. It's programmable, it has storage capability, it has all these input devices, uh, but HP never called it a computer. They called it a calculator. 
If they would have called it a computer, the engineers and scientists who would put in a purchase order for this would have all kinds of red tape to go through. So the world wasn't ready, the bureaucracy wasn't ready for personal people or individuals buying what they would call a personal computer yet. Then in the middle of the 1970s, 1975, Popular Electronics Magazine came out with an article about the world's first mini computer kit to rival commercial models, the Altair 8800. And this was a box of parts you could order, put them together, but instead of the little soda straws that came with a Digicomp, it had switches on the front panel. And you program this thing by, the switch is e this switch is either on or off, this one's either on or off. But this, this was meeting a pent up demand of the day. And this was one of the most uh, uh, requested sets of plans that Popular Electronics had ever run. And the Altair company started selling kits of parts. And uh, they were, they, their success inspired a lot of other entrepreneurs to advertise computer kits. And it's interesting the way they funded this, this uh, early computer business. Uh, some wizard would come up with a design for a computer, put a, a bag of parts together as a kit, then it'd take him in, in a magazine and he would say, okay, you can buy this computer kit for $495 or whatever, and if somebody sent him the $495, he went out and bought the parts and shipped them to you. <laughs> uh, so it was actually funded by the customers instead of by any corporate business plan or anything. What made this possible? Why, I mean, way back years before, Hewlett Packard and their engineers, they knew how to do this stuff. Uh, way back before then, when I went to work at Bell Telephone Laboratories in 1961, my supervisor, when I was, he was introducing me to the place, he got out his pencil and he put a little tiny dot on a piece of paper and he said, we've got some guys here at Bell Labs that are putting all the electronics required for a TV set in a spot that big. So in the early 60s, big companies like, like uh, Bell Labs, AT&T, IBM, they had all the components necessary to do this. But why didn't it happen then? Well, according to Adam Osborne's history of personal computers, this was possibly one of the reasons, sort of. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So in less than 10 years after Kennedy gave that famous speech, uh, we went to the moon. But in the meantime, we had this big government supported project in the aerospace industry to build all the components for, for this new space race. And what was going on was, uh, well, up until then, if you were a, a really top engineering graduate or student out of a, a program, one of the, the engineering schools, you might have gotten hired by Bell Labs or IBM or whatever. And the, the common cliche when I went to work at Bell Labs in 1961 was, well, once you get hired by Ma Bell, you're there for life. I mean, you have job security, and this, this is your company until you retire. Well, it didn't turn out that, long, that way for very long, but it had been that way for decades. People got hired into a company, and they knew they were going to be there. But here's what happened when the aerospace business got going. Companies like McDonnell, Douglas, uh, Intel, whatever, they wanted to get these government contracts but they had to have the personnel to support justifying getting the contract. So they hired all these bright young engineers and scientists out of the colleges to put on their staff so that they'd get the contract. But if they didn't get the contract, they let all these guys go. Uh, and they would go down the street to the other company that got the contract and work there until that contract dried up. And they started bouncing around and all of a sudden there wasn't the, the personal loyalty to a company that there used to be. So that combined with the fact that these guys knew all this latest stuff and they had no company loyalty and they got the opportunity, let's put a bag of parts together and sell it for $495 a copy and make a company out of it. Uh, that contributed to the development of the personal computer industry. 
Early on, I started subscribing to some of the personal computer magazines. Uh, one of the first was Creative Computing, uh, started by a guy named David All from Morristown, New Jersey, which is right near where I worked at Bell Labs. And, and he had made a little bit of money because up until that time, there were basic language, language programming computers available, usually PDP-11s or Timeshare or whatever. But he had come out with a book, 101 Basic Computer Games. And if you bought the book, you got program listings, step one, step two, and you could type those into your computer or into your timeshare computer or whatever and play these little games. And it was a big seller, and he used that money partly to fund this magazine, Creative Computing. Uh, the Compute magazine followed shortly thereafter, and it was more of the, the uh, applications people, not the people who really wanted to get into the nuts and bolts or the zeros and ones of the computer. The other big one was Byte magazine, and this is one all the techies subscribe to. This is where you got the articles on the zeros and ones and the hexadecimal and all the stuff that went on inside these things that people were building. <clears throat> At the same time, with the same kind of electronic components, the video game business got going. And the same parts in a video game are used inside a personal computer. And this was the uh, very popular Atari 2600 computer, which, which grew out of Nolan Bushnell's company that he started when he created the game called Pong. Any of you ever remember the Pong game? Where you had these two things on a screen or the ball bouncing back and forth and you, two players try to keep the ball bouncing. Well, that grew into quite a company uh, called Atari by Nolan Bush Bushnell. And this more advanced game, a little more advanced than a Pong, had cartridges with electronics inside. And you could plug the cartridge in and change games or virtually change the program. This dedicated computer, but not general purpose computer, uh, would be able to, to run or play. In September of 1977, there was in Scientific American a full-page advertisement promoting something called the Bally Home Library Computer. And this was my first real computer. Um, I got one of these, and this looks a little bit like an arcade game. Uh, it has a place to plug cartridges in. It has these fairly strange controllers that looks like a handle of a, of a gun, and there's a trigger. And so there were two of them, and you could play guns, gun fighting games with your friends with them. The place where the hammer of the gun would be was actually a little knob that was like a joystick, and you could also twist it. So you could use these controllers to do all kinds of things. But inside this were the, the microprocessor chips used in computers. And you could get a cartridge that had the basic programming language on, plug it in there, and then you could use this 24-key calculator keypad to write programs in basic. You plugged this thing into your regular TV set, and you could plug it into a regular old cassette recorder to store your programs that you wrote. So this was a, a full-blown personal computer very early. Uh, they also were at the computer shows demonstrating an add-on keyboard and floppy disk drive for this thing. I looked into the Bally uh, company at that time, and I thought this was interesting because I thought, hey, this this computer business is about ready to go, and their stock was selling for $16 a share, and unfortunately, we were still on a negative income, and I couldn't buy any. But, uh, uh, but the Bally Corporation was a major manufacturing uh, manufacturer of pinball machines, which were full of electronics. They had all the factories set up to do the printed circuit boards, to install the chips. They were ready to produce these things in mass. Uh, but what happened was, strangely enough, New Jersey legalized gambling. The Bally Corporation is also a major manufacturer of one-armed bandits, so the executives at Bally said, let's not mess with those com that Never Neverland computer stuff. We've got to put all our energy into Atlantic City and, and build things for that. So they ba basically dropped a very advanced computer that they could have gone with. They could have been Apple or whatever. Uh, but they didn't. They, they gave the rights to this to some small company that manufactured these for a while as an arcade game, but not as a full-blown computer. But this was programmable, and you could store your programs, do all the things that a personal computer of the day could do. Well, not uh, about almost contemporary with that, these three computers hit the market that weren't kits. The TRS-80, the Radio Shack Trash-80, as some people called it, uh, the Commodore PET and the Apple II. 
Now you'll notice that the TRS-80 has a full keyboard, it has a monitor, monochrome monitor, and it has a cassette tape recorder, so you could write programs, again in the basic progr programming language, uh, and you could store them. You could also pick up a program on a cassette and play it into this, into its memory, and play games with it. Similarly, the Commodore PET also had a built-in cassette player. Uh, and a monochrome monitor that came with it. They had a full keyboard, but they also had a numeric keypad, so you could type in numbers in a hurry with this. The Apple II, they sold it like this, and everything else was an optional accessory, and before long, most people were, were adding a monochrome monitor and a couple of disk drives to their Apple II. Uh, but these were all about the same time frame, and uh, all started making inroads into the personal computer business. Remember the Atari game? Uh, well, this guy, Nolan Bushnell, who had the Atari company, he had the game division, which was the cash cow. They were, they were, well, actually what happened is he made quite a bit of money and eventually sold out the Atari company to another company uh, that used this as a cash cow. Uh, and he took $38 million uh, and uh, went away with a promise that he would never do anything to compete with them for a certain number of years, no other products. Nolan Bushnell took his $38 million and went and started a thing called Chuck E. Cheese, uh, <laughs> which didn't do as well as his Atari game. But the same inner workings were turned by their another division of Atari into the Atari 800 computer. And this was my, my first computer with a real keyboard, was the Atari 800. It had some of the characteristics of the game machine in that if you opened it up, you had a place to plug in cartridges. You could put in different cartridges, one of which was a basic programming language cartridge. It also had a place to make it very easy to add 8K or 16K of random access memory. It came in a larger size cartridge, plugged right in. This thing could plug into a regular color TV set, had places for joysticks for playing games, um, and it, it could be plugged into a floppy disk drive as well. The difference between the Atari 800 and its arch rivals of the day, they all used the same microprocessor chip on the inside, but there was a genius in the company uh, who developed custom coprocessing chips, one for graphics, uh, one for sound, and one for input-output. And so, well, if you move the mouse around uh, or did something on the Apple or the Trash 80, the central processor was 100% occupied with doing all the calculations. Let's see, did he move the mouse? Did he move it? He moved the mouse. I better erase that part, ready to redraw this part. But the Atari 800 had a separate processor just to do that stuff. So the 6502, the main processor, had nothing to do. So this was a lot more computer. And in those days, if you wanted to have really good games, you needed more, more computer power. A lot of people said, well, this is a great games machine, but, well, if you said it was a, if you accused a, a, a machine to being a great games machine, you were accusing it of being a powerful computer because games are very demanding in high-speed calculations and graphics, and the ones they have out today are amazing in the graphics they do. So the Atari 800 came along. Then a guy named Adam Osborne came along, and he decided well, people would like to carry those computers around with them. So he came out with the Osborne. Anybody ever have one of those? Uh, oh, yeah. This thing came, you, you opened up the, the case. It looked like a little suitcase. You opened up the case, and it unfolded the keyboard with a numeric keypad, had a couple of floppy disk drives, had its own little monochrome display, and it came with some software bundled. You could do word processing. You could do spreadsheets. You could do database management stuff, and it knew the basic programming language, had a couple of connectors here to connect it up to your printer, and it was, they called it portable, it was a pre uh, precursor of our laptops, it was, some people preferred to call it transportable, because what a weight, about 38 pounds or something, <laughs> it, it, you'd stretch your arm if you ported this very much, but uh, um, now in the, the business school world, a lot of people point to Adam Osborne as a, a classic case of mismarketing. Uh, although the legend may be not completely accurate, the legend is that Osborne came out one day with a big announcement. He announced the new Osborne executive uh, and that he was going to sell and make more money because he made quite a bit of money on this. But the same day, he said, oh, and by the way, 
The next thing is going to be the Osborne Professional. You're really going to like that. So what happened is people said, hmm, I think I'll wait till the professional comes out. <laughs> and uh, they didn't buy the executive, and, and Osborne went bankrupt. Um, there are other versions of the story that has to do with his money manager or whatever, but, but that's the nice legend about a business model. And it, by the way, whether it's completely true or not, companies to this day in the computer business are very cognizant of trying not to announce something too soon to kill the sales of their current products. So the Osborne computer got us into the transportable, but it also got us into a package deal with software. These things could do uh, word processing and spreadsheets. They were useful. Now remember my little tale of, of HP not wanting to call their personal computer a personal computer because of all the bureaucracy in the companies. The other issue in those days was not only the, the approval required to buy a computer for your company, the other thing is suppose you needed a little spreadsheet program and you went to the MIS department, the, the, the Management Information System department, you said, hey, could you work up a, a program for me on my terminal to your mini or maxi computer to do this kind of calculation? And they would say, oh yeah, we can do that. Uh, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you in, a, in three, four months or so. Well, people didn't like that when they discovered that they could pick up this thing and haul it in, or their Apple II, which could do the same programs, uh, and bring them into the office and do some real work instead of waiting around a few months for their MIS department to come up with a word processor for them or a spreadsheet or whatever. So these computers, personal computers, started coming into the back door of companies rather than from the top down, which had been a model for computing up to then. The top executives would sit, make a decision, yeah, we're gonna have a computer in this company, and it would trickle down to the people. Now the people were bringing it in from the bottom and, and making it do useful work. So finally what happened is that the IBM company said, well, maybe we ought to get in on that action. And, but they didn't take it completely seriously. And so they turned loose a group of people down in Boca Raton, Florida. They said, come up, one of these, come up with one of these personal computer things for us and so we can sell it and get, a, get rid of those apples. And, and one, of the, one of the cliches of these days, by the way, was that if you were in the, the MIS business, Management Information System, and you were gonna specify a computer, the, the cliches was no one ever got fired for specifying IBM hardware. You might have decided that a different company's computer was better, faster, cheaper, but if you tried to sell it to the manager or whatever, it was really a hard sell. But if you said, oh, I wanna buy one of these IBM things, it was an easy sell because IBM had the, the marketing power and the pinstripe suit mafia that really had a lot of influence all the way to the bankers of the companies who were financing these things. But anyway, IBM turned these guys loose and unlike everything they had done up till then, which was completely proprietary, if you bought an IBM computer, you'd had to get software from IBM and only IBM. You had to get all the parts from only IBM. Well, this one, they threw some generic parts together and they needed something to make it go. They wanted to have basic programming language in it. And there was this kid who had supplied a, basic, a version of basic for a number of different small computer companies, a kid named Gates up there in Seattle. And, but there was this other guy, uh, the early operating system was common in most all of the computers, was called CPM, uh, Control Path Microcomputer. A guy named Gary Kildall out in California had this. And he had, that was a real operating system, not just a, a basic programming language. So the IBM suits scheduled a meeting to go talk to Kildall out in California and the, about creating an operating system for their new PC. And the legend goes that Kildall was a hobbyist pilot and he got up in the morning and he said, that's just too nice to go and meet with all those silly suits. I'm gonna go flying today. So the IBM suits showed up, they talked to Kildall's wife and they said, well, would like, like him to put together this operating system for us. But, well, she says, he's not here right now. He said, well, maybe you could sign an a exclusive uh, non-disclosure agreement with us about an operating system. And she said, well, I'm not signing anything without my husband being around. So these guys left and discussed, and they said, well, what else can we do? He said, well, there's this kid up there in Seattle named, named Gates. Let's go talk to him. So he said, yeah, I can do an operating system for you. His father was a lawyer, by the way, which I'm sure helped. And so the contract that, that Gates managed to pull with IBM, unprecedented in anything IBM had done, was a non-exclusive deal. They created something called PC-DOS, the operating system for the IBM PC, 
with the right to market on the side MS-DOS, which was assembly, essentially the same operating system, and they could sell it to anybody they wanted to. So, now IBM announces their PC, and all these people who were afraid to not specify IBM uh, were buying these things, and every time you bought one, I know I bought one for 2,500 bucks, I had to pay $65 extra for the operating system, and that money went to Microsoft. Uh, and in the meantime, other companies were negotiating with Gates to use MS-DOS, which was the same as PC-DOS. And uh, as you know, the rest is history. Eventually, uh, Microsoft drove IBM right out of the personal computer business. Uh, now, you will recall my little story about the Atari company and uh, the game machine and the computer division. And what happened was... The computer division had this really slick computer with all these custom coprocessors, and they wanted to sell it, but the game division, which was the cash cow, they had a new, the more expensive game that they wanted to sell at a higher price, and these guys wanted to sell a general person, person uh, a general purpose computer. And the game division guys won, and so the Atari 800 kind of got pushed down in Atari's marketing plans, and the geniuses behind this thing kind of were disgusted, and so they left. They quit, and they started their own little company, and uh, yeah. company Amiga. And uh, when I was at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, I had been reading about this, this computer that was supposed to be mythical, it hadn't come out yet, and uh, so I went to the Amiga booth, and what they were doing was they were selling parts for games. You could buy a joy board, a little platform that you plugged into your video game and you could do skiing games and surfing games and things like that. That's how they were funding the development of this Amiga. The Amiga that I saw behind closed doors blew me away because it had built-in speech synthesizer, both a male and female voice. You just click a button and any text that would come on the screen, it would read it to you. Hello, this is the Amiga computer. Uh, it also had uh, graphics. It had a, a capability of doing both command line interpreter type programming or it could do a GUI interface, a graphical user interface, and the graphics was de designed by this genius, Jay Miner, who did the custom graphics processor for the old Atari, and it was an amazing piece of work. It also had a true multitasking operating system, and it was just a remarkable piece of technology for 1985. And uh, after coming home from that, that behind the doors show of the Amiga, I told my friends, I don't know who's gonna sell this or win, but I'm gonna have one. And uh, the Amiga guys didn't have enough money to go national with this thing. So they signed a, a deal with Commodore to become an operating subdivision of the Commodore company. And that was a mistake. But uh, Commodore ended up with a Commodore Amiga, and that's a case study in anti-marketing. They killed off the most advanced product of its day. As a matter of fact, let me go, go back to the Amiga slide here for a minute. At one time, I got pretty close to the, the, especially the educational marketing division of the Amiga company because I had been doing, uh, pursuing a dream that never got pursued. I had been playing with laser video discs, the big 12-inch ones, um, and you could put uh, 54,000 color slides on one side of one disc or 30 minutes of full motion television. The Amiga... Uh, had television capability and you could actually, if you plugged in a video signal, you could superimpose the Amiga display over the video coming from something like a video disc. And so my dream was to create instructional materials, visual aids, on video disc, write computer programs on the Amiga that were tutorials and use the graphics together with the computer interface and I actually did that. I wired up some laser video disc. By the way, if you were on frame number one and you wanted to jump to frame 54,000 on one of the Panasonic uh, disc, laser disc players, it was less than one second access time. Think of that visual database. Well, unfortunately for me, that, that uh, technology didn't take off, but the Amiga technology was remarkable. It was way ahead of its time. Eventually, uh, I, at one time I was a registered Amiga developer developing some educational software, supposedly, and things. And later on, I uh, managed to, uh, because the Amiga was, was killed off by either IBM moles inside the Commodore company or just blunders like most marketing people seem to do. In any case, uh, 
the, I, the, the PC world was evolving into uh, Microsoft finally got around to doing a GUI interface called Windows. And I went to Atlanta to a Microsoft devol developers con uh, conference <clears throat> when they were working on the version of Windows that became Windows 95. And having been to Amiga conferences almost 10 years before, where they talked about all the background things that the programmers had, the tools available for programmers to develop software and the interfaces and graphics and all this kind of stuff, having seen that, and then later on sitting in the Microsoft development conference, I suddenly started batting myself on the head and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, have I gone back in time? It looks like I am back at an Amiga developers conference. The, the uh, Microsoft outfit had hired a bunch of those geniuses from Amiga to work on Windows 95. And when Windows 95 came out, I observed that it had almost caught up to the 1985 Amiga. But the best technology doesn't always bubble to the top. Uh, sometimes it's the best marketing or who has the best uh, political power that bubbles to the top. In any case, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on with the, the guts of the, the personal computers. Remember back in the, the schoolhouse when we talked about binary arithmetic and we talked about you can keep track, you can do binary arithmetic with zero and one or switches that are either on or off. Well, transistors can act like on-off switches. And the early microprocessors that were used in a personal computer had the equivalent of about 2,300 transistors. Back in the 70s, uh, a professor, Gordon Moore, came up with what, he, what is now referred to as Moore's Law. And he analyzed what was going on in the development of microprocessors. And he came up with the idea that the processing power of these things doubles every 18 to 24 months. And he predicted that back in the 1970s, and it's still true. We're still going along on the curve where the number of transistors, alias computer power, has been doubling every 18 to, to 24 months. Till we get to nowadays, instead of 2,300 tr equivalent transistors, the, the processor chips that are now used in both the uh, Apple Macs and the PCs can do 2,600 million transistors. Um, to try to put that in perspective, imagine that, uh, because this is not a, a linear scale, this is a, a logarithmic scale. Notice that the difference from, or the distance from 100,000 to 1 million is the same as from 100,000 to to uh, a billion. Uh, so if we drew this all in a linear scale, we'd have to have a piece of paper that went up past the roof to draw it. So it's, it's a logarithmic scale, so the scale changes as you go up. But if, to put this in perspective, suppose that, oh, you know about how thick a sheet of paper is. Suppose you had 2,300 sheets of paper. How big a stack would that be? Uh, maybe about five inches tall, right? Suppose that you had 2,600 2, million sheets of paper in a stack. How big do you think that stack would be? It would be about 1,200 miles high. <laughs> uh, that's the change in processor power in the last 40 years. Uh, putting it another way, if you put it out along the ground, at this level, that's uh, less than half of your footprint, okay? At this level, it's from here to Colorado. <laughs> uh, it's astronomical, the increase in power. Most people's uh, smartphones have tremendously more computing power than the computers that took us to the moon and back had. Uh, and you have it for a few hundred dollars, or in our case, for $180 each, we have that kind of computer power in the computer room now, times six we just bought. Um, so what we can do with these uh, zeros and ones multiplied by the billions is remarkable. And, and I won't go into the story about all the stuff that, that the application stuff that we're doing. When I was subscribing to Creative Computing Magazine and, and Compute and Byte, the pundits, the magazine writers were trying to guess what would these things be good for? And they would guess things like, Maybe somebody could keep their recipes in the kitchen on this. They can balance their checkbook on these personal things. And, and one of the pundits said, well, the personal computer is a solution 
looking for a problem. <laughs> and and uh, now you can hardly do anything without a personal computer. I know you can't apply for a job sweeping floors at Kmart without getting onto a computer and, and uh, applying online. Um, hardly any business that you can do now with these things. Let's just briefly talk about the operating systems. In the old days, the early operating systems, well, before there were personal computers, uh, Bell Labs developed an operating system for the mini computers called Unix, and it was pretty pervasive. It was, the operating system is, is the secret computer program that hides inside the computer that lets humans interact with it, okay? And the people that write operating systems are operating at a machine level rather than a human level. They're, they're almost down to the zeros and ones at some point. But Unix was around, and uh, then we, we, when the PCs came out, when the, the processor chips came out and were affordable, uh, we came out with Kildall's CPM, Control Program Monitor. Uh, and that was followed when more and more computers came out with Apple DOS, Commodore DOS, TRS DOS, Atari DOS. Uh, every one of the computer manufacturers created their own operating system, not quite the same as the others. And uh, that made it difficult to go from computer to computer. And if you wanted to communicate between computers through something that is now known as the internet, and you created a, a word processing document, and you Commodore DOS, and you sent it to your friend that was using Apple DOS, they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to each other. And so in order to do that, we came out with something, or they came out with something called HTML, hypertext markup language, so everybody could say, send plain text, alphabetic text, which actually the tr computer translates into zeros and ones, uh, but they could send it, and then the other computer could take that text and translate it with their operating system into their version of, of that display. In any case, there were a whole bunch of these variations of DOS, and I already hinted at the story of how PC-DOS and MS-DOS came about with Bill Gates and his clever negotiating with uh, uh, IBM and the fact that IBM, when in those days they used to, in the computer business, they used to say, well, if IBM sneezes, all the other companies get pneumonia. <laughs> IBM was the, the lion and uh, uh, it drove other computer developers crazy because you had to be IBM PC compatible to make a go of it. And I remember the, the engineers at, at Heath that came out with a, a personal computer and NCR, National Cash Register, they had a personal computer. And, and uh, Sanyo had one. And even AT&T had one at one time. They all went crazy because they had to go back and disenhance the capability of their computer so it was IBM compatible. The fact that IBM DOS MS-DOS became the de facto standard, set back applications of, of microcomputers quite a long time. And the fact that, that Microsoft, with its Windows, became the de facto standard, set applications back at least 10 years. Because 10 years before, the, the Amiga computer was doing stuff that we now can do, uh, that, but we couldn't do it with uh, Windows 95. Uh, IBM, at some point, they decided, well, hey, wait a minute. This guy ba Gates is getting out of control and, and we don't want to be using the same PC DOS that he's selling to everybody else in the world. So they came out with their own operating system called Operating System 2, OS2. Um, but it was too little too late. By then, there were so many competitors to, for personal computers that IBM was pretty much out of the running. Because when they had the guys in Boca Raton create their own, they made it relatively generic, not proprietary. And the cat was already out of the bag. Amiga DOS was a little bit unique in that it was, had a disk operating system similar to the others, but it also had a graphical user interface. And that's what we're up to by now. Uh, something called a GUI, or graphical user interface. The legend goes that when Steve Jobs uh, and some of his friends were touring, uh, Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, they wandered around, and Xerox had a lot of advanced computer stuff that they were working on, but they weren't interested in selling personal computers, and they had all developed all kinds of neat stuff they didn't do much with. And, and Jobs was walking around, he said, gee, what are these guys doing? They've, they've got pictures on the screen, and they don't have to type in words. They just push this little hockey puck thing with a wire, we now call a mouse, around and, and do stuff with it. 
And we ought to use that. So they, they took that idea and developed uh, the Macintosh interface, which is a graphical user interface. And here you have pictures of, of documents instead of lines where you have to type in the name of the document. And, and they have this little thing that says trash. At one time, Apple uh, claimed that they owned the rights to the concept of a trash can. So Microsoft calls theirs a recycle bin to, to stay out of court with Apple. In any case, um, the Amiga DOS had a graphical user interface also, but with one click you could be in command line interpreter mode and a lot of the, the computer jockeys didn't like to have to push these pictures around and click on these drawers that we now call folders in, in Microsoft. Uh, they liked the power of typing in all these obscure arcane commands to control their computers. So with Amiga DOS, you could have the best of those worlds. Uh, then Microsoft finally got on board with a graphical user interface, uh, and it was Windows 3.1, which most people consider was kind of brain damaged and not very competitive with, with some of the others. Um, eventually, though, um, they, they went on to uh, other wor versions of Windows that got, got better with each incantation. What about in 2012? Well, you can get down to the old Mac store and you can buy one of these things, uh, a full-blown high-power Macintosh. And uh, Apple is alive and well and they're financially extremely rich, partly because for the same computer power as you, you get with this machine, for about a third the price, you can get a PC. But don't tell Gary Baker I said that because the, the Apple cult gets all upset about this. But in any case, um, they, the, the newest high-end PCs and the newest high-end Apples, Macs, are using the same high-end Intel multi-core processor with all those millions of equivalent transistors in. So if it wasn't for software differences, and, and you can start a fist fight in any group of computer users by saying, this interface is better than that interface, and they'll choose up sides and they'll fight over it, uh, uh, which is the easiest, which is better to use, etc. There's one other option for operating systems in 2012, and it's called Linux. And Linux is based on that old Unix operating system, but it now has, includes a, a GUI, a graphical user interface. The thing about Linux that differentiates it from either the Mac interface or the PC interface is that this operating system computer code is in the public domain. It's open source code. It's free. So if you have some computer hardware, you can get a hold of a disk for free and install one of the versions of Linux is called Ubuntu. And uh, it's a third choice in operating systems these days. Well, where is the world going to in 2012 and beyond? Nobody really knows that, but where it seems to be going right now is in more portable computing, a long ways from the old Adam Osborne suitcase. Now we've got these little tablets. And uh, what the future of desktop PCs will be, everybody's speculating about. I'm, I'm doubting that people who want to write books with, a, with word processing or desktop publishing software, I doubt that they're going to use the touchpad on one of these uh, uh, pads, uh, the portable computer where touchscreen things. There are applications where these are, are probably superior. There are applications where the desktop is still superior. What new genius will come up with what new kind of goodie uh, to take us to the next level? I'm not sure. How about a question or two? <laughs> Got blisters on your ears now, don't you? <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> so anyway, that's my fractured, fragmented, warped history of how we got here from there, or at least how I got here from the, the Digicomp. There's a question here. Uh, various operating systems. Uh, TV. Uh, w with various operating systems, is one better for one thing and another for another? Um, a few years, the question is, is one operating system better for one thing than another? And a few years ago, you could pick one and make a pretty good case for some certain applications. But right now, it's harder and harder to make that case. 
The case you can make, though, is, is there certain software that will only run on this platform or that platform, and is that software just the one you need? In the early days, when I sort of had a reputation of being able to say RAM and ROM and know what I was talking about, people would ask me for advice about, what computer should I buy? And I got into the habit of saying, that's the wrong question. That's, that's the last question you should ask. The first question is, what do you want to do with a computer? And once you decided what you wanted to do with it, then you could ask question two, which was, okay, what computer program do I need to be able to do that thing? And then you ask the third question, which was, what computer will it take to run that program? So there are some programs that some would argue in the video editing business are much slicker on the Mac than they are on the PC. And that was definitely true 10 years ago. Not so much true now because, hey, you got 90% of the market to write software for or 10%. You know that some developers are going to aim at the 90% and they're, they're all playing duplicating and catch up and, and trying to get to jump on the others. Um, Ubuntu Linux, uh, if you install it on your machine, you automatically get Mozilla Firefox, Mozilla Thunderbird for doing email. You get a whole raft of applications. And because it's open source, there are tens of thousands of, of serious programmers out there not owing their allegiance to any company who are rewriting applications. However, I'm not ready to throw away Louis II for Ubuntu Linux because I can't do Sibelius music software on Linux at this point. So the one uh, kind of link that got flashed over there too is that uh, when Mac was getting aging with its operating system. It's new operating system that, Bill, that uh, Steve Jobs came up with called uh, OS X is basically a form of Unix. And so the Unix and Ubuntu, to, that there's that relationship yeah. as well. Yeah, the point is there, the core of a lot of these operating system options is really, they, they have the same DNA at their heart. I mean, they, they have a common core. And so um, it's really a function of, of what, what cult you want to join, or <laughs> what program is your favorite, and what machine does it run on? Ask another, please. In the front row, if you will, Don. Uh, hold on, hold up for the microphone. Yeah, let's go way back to the beginning. And uh, I'd like to know how, well, I, I can understand how uh, the digital I mean, uh, the binary math. The binary math turns into our number system. How do we turn it into letters? And then, and then beyond that, how do you separate the letters? How do you separate the words? <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, what about the alphabet? We talked about all the numbers you can represent with zeros and ones. Well, at some point, all the different computer people got together in some conference someplace. They said, we, got to, we have to agree on a common system of turning numbers into the alphabet. And so they came out with a standard called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. -S -I. And uh, they made decimal numeric equivalents, which of course can be translated into binary numeric equivalents, for the alphabet. And so the lowercase a is number 65. And in the early personal computers, if you were programming in basic, you could give a certain command and say, print something, something 65, and it would print an A, uh, letter A. Now, inside today's operating system, at one point, does the operating system know whether it's, that's a number or a letter? It has to do with the context of where the computer processes are and whatever. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to quote Arthur C. Clarke's second law, which is, any significantly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so that translation from numbers to alphanumeric characters, let's call it magic. Well, I see that my time has expired and you're about to, so I'll hang around for questions if you like them. But otherwise, thanks for coming and listening. <laughs>